Welcome to Analyze USB Traffic with Wireshark session. My name is Tomasz Moin and I work as Senior Firmware Engineer at Nordic Semiconductor. During office hours, I mostly work on USB support in Zephyr. You can reach out to me in USB channel on Zephyr Discord server. The presentation starts with introduction covering basic terminology, speeds, connectors, and why USB 2 is still relevant. I will mention the USB transfer types and device classes. Then I will show USB traffic capture options and outline the main difference between software and hardware sniffers. I picked USB mass storage as an example because USB memory stick is really well known device. The mass storage USB protocol layer is simple and various mass storage detector in Wireshark. At the end, there will be short summary. Please write down all your questions so I can answer them later. Let's start with the terminology. Both USB and networking use the same words, but with a slightly different meaning. The analogies I present might not be quite exact, but I consider them good enough to get the big picture. USB host can be seen as requester because it initiates all the communication and also as DHCP server because it assigns addresses to devices. Example host is a PC or laptop. USB device is responder because it responds to host requests. Even when the device is sending data to host, it is essentially responding to host requests. Example device is a mouse. Port in USB means the physical port connector. A host can have multiple ports. Every device requires one port. If the host does not have enough ports, then we can use hub. And that's similar to switch or hub known from networking world. Thanks to hub, we can connect more devices to a single host port like keyboard or USB memory. In order for communication to work, every device needs an address. The address is similar to local IP address, except the range is much smaller. After reset, the device defaults to address 0, and then host sets device address to value from 1 to 127. Endpoint is essentially a buffer. From other sync point of view, endpoint number can be seen as analogy to TCP or UDP port. Each endpoint operates using one of the four available transfer types. USB class pretty much defines the communication protocol. The scripter is like a data sheet that holds reads to know what type of device it is talking to. Vendor ID is 16-bit vendor code assigned by USB implementers forum, and product ID is 16-bit product code. However, unlike MAC addresses, vendor ID and product ID pair only identifies the device model, not a particular unit. When a USB was introduced back in 1996, the A and B connectors were used. A is at the host side, B is at the device. Initially, the connector had only four pins, 5 volt V bus, grant, D plus, and D minus. The D plus and D minus signals form a differential pair. Because there is just a single differential pair in USB 2.0, only half duplex communication is possible. Media access in USB is simple. If the host doesn't ask device for data, the device cannot send anything. When the host asks for data, the device has to pretty much respond instantly because the timeouts are pretty short. Full and high speed timeouts are in hundreds and other seconds range. At high speed, in the worst case scenario when there are five hubs in between the host and device, the timeout occurs if host does not start receiving response within 1.7 microseconds. Hopefully the USB peripherals handle the timeouts in hardware. For example, when host reads data, the peripheral will knock the transaction unless the firmware has already armed the endpoint with data. Similar, when the host writes data, the device will knock if the endpoint buffer is in empty. USB 3 adds two separate superspeed differential pairs, SSTX and SSRX. When device operates in backwards compatibility mode, it uses dedicated USB 2 differential pair. The superspeed traffic happens solely at SSTX and SSRX. USB 3 is dual simplex, and it has one differential pair in each direction. USB 2, published in April 2000, featured three transmission speeds, low at 1.5 megabits, full speed at 12 megabits, and high speed at 480 megabits. USB 3 is not so simple. USB 3.0, published in November 2008, featured 8 gigabits transmission speed. The 3.1, published in July 2013, doubled the speed to 10 gigabits using the same connectors. The 3.2, published in September 2017, introduced two-lane transmission requiring new USB Type-C connector. The 10 gigabits can be achieved either on single lane by doubling the frequency or by using two 5 gigabits lanes simultaneously. 20 gigabits connection uses two lanes 
each operating at 10 gigabits. Super speed devices operate on completely separate bandwidth than USB 2.0 devices. All heavy bandwidth users, like network cards and storage devices, generally use super speed nowadays. USB 4, published in August 2019, added 40 gigabits, and USB 4 version 2, published in October 2022, added 80 gigabits symmetric and 120 gigabits asymmetric. Asymmetry makes sense if there is more traffic in one direction, for example when there are multiple monitor monitors connected. USB 4 requires Type-C connector and is essentially tunneling protocol. USB Type-C connector is reversible, so we don't have to worry which side is up, as it works either way. In the middle, there are D-plus and D-minus signals used for USB 2. These are used by Zephyr USB device stack. The CC1 and CC2 form configuration channel and are used for USB power delivery implemented by Zephyr USB C stack. USB power delivery can be used to change the voltage on the VBUS pins. The voltage can be from 20 volt in standard power, uh, can go up to 20 volt in standard power range and up to 48 volt in extended power range. The maximum current is 5 amps. To deliver standard power range, maximum 100 watts power, but is 20 volt at 5 amps, or to use extended power range, the electronically marked cable assembly is needed. The electronically marked cable includes e marker chip in the plug, but responds to USB PD discover identity command. USB power delivery is also used to enter USB 4 or configure alternate mode like Thunderbolt 3 or DisplayPort. USB 3 device supporting alternate modes can, for example, agree with the host to use TX1 and RX1 for DisplayPort and TX2 and RX2 for uh, USB communication. The SBU1 and SBU2 are sideband used for alternate mode. DisplayPort alternate mode uses SBU pins as auxiliary channels. USB 4 uses SPU pins to negotiate USB 4 link parameters and to manage line equalization. USB 4 devices are already available at the market, and you might be wondering if it's worthwhile to get familiar with USB 2.0. The truth is, but USB 2.0 is not going anywhere. The backwards compatibility is achieved by dual bus, and the upper layers are pretty much the same. Every USB 3 hub contains both USB 2 and USB 3 hub inside. USB Hub is the only device that can operate at USB 2 and 3 speeds simultaneously. The new connectors, including the USB Type-C, contain dedicated USB 2 D plus D minus signals. All USB 2 rules apply on D plus D minus signals. There's a lot of devices that are fine with USB 2.0 speeds, keyboard, mouse, or controllers. For example, Nintendo Switch Pro controller comes with USB Type-C connector, but it is in fact a full-speed device. USB stands for Universal Serial Bus. To be universal, it must be able to support many devices. Many devices mean different needs. All possible transfer types are generalized into four types. USB supports plug-and-play and is able to detect what type of device is connected. Plug-and-play is possible thanks to control transfers. Every USB device knows how to respond to get the script or command. The script contains basic information about device that hosts can use to know how to talk to it. Control transfer can be also used for vendor commands, for example for volume adjustment. Control transfer is the only mandatory transfer type. Interrupt has nothing to do with interrupt in the classical sense. Interrupt transfer is intended to handle things that used to be handled via interrupts in the past. The host will periodically poll the device for interrupt data. The polls will happen often enough to meet the latency requirement. Failed polls will be retried. Example use cases for interrupt transfer are human interface devices like keyboard or mouse. Isochronous transfer are good for streaming audio or video. Isochronous transfer is periodic with guaranteed bandwidth, but there isn't any retry or guarantee of delivery. To transfer large data, the bulk transfer should be used. The data can be transferred the fastest using the bulk transfer. The catch is, there's no guarantee about latency or bandwidth, but for plenty of applications it doesn't matter. Example use case for bulk transfer is mass storage or network adapter. USB class defines the language host talks with the device. 
There are some USB specific classes but are not similar to other protocols like HAP or human interface device. HIP class is actually pretty complex, but in my opinion, it has successfully solved the configuration issues for basic input peripherals. We can pretty much be sure that the basic functionality of USB mouse will simply work after connecting it to the computer. Some classes are just a simple protocol wrappers. For example, mass storage usually wraps SCSI. Communication device class wraps AT commands, internet range, or just plain serial data. Printer class wraps IEEE 12.84, and there are also vendor-specific classes. For example, FTDI USB to serial converters use vendor-specific protocol. Moving on to traffic capture. The traffic can be captured in software. On Linux with USB mods module, on Windows using USB pickup, and on Mac using XHC interface. There are open source, software, uh, open source hardware USB 2 snippers available. OpenVisla, which is not only open source but also open hardware project, and there's Lambda Concept USB 2 snipper for which only the software is open source. If you have logic analyzer, you can decode low and full speed USB signaling with Silver. To my best knowledge, there are no open source USB 3 hardware sniffers. If you are working on one, please let me know. After loading USB MON module, if we have permission to access USB MON, the USB MON interfaces appear in Wireshark interfaces list. USB 0 interface is special interface that groups all root hubs. The other USB MON instances correspond to host controller interfaces. When we list devices using LSUSB, we can see multiple Linux Foundation root hubs. These are funny devices. Inside computer, there is at least one host controller interface chip. All its hub functionality in Linux is modeled with funny root hub device. The extensible host controller is modeled as two root hubs, one for USB 2 and one for USB 3. When we want to capture some specific device, for example, Zephyr MSC sample, we can find it in LS USB output. Here it is, device 17 on bus 3. Therefore, mass storage traffic can be captured on USB MON 3 interface. LSUSB shows 2FE3 as Nordic Semiconductor because Linux USB USB IDS has incorrect entries. 2FE3 is in fact Zephyr project vendor ID and Nordic Semiconductor vendor ID is 1915. I have reported this to Linux USB, but it will take time before it is fixed. Note that the device number displayed for devices connected to XACI host controller is not necessarily matching the address assigned to the device. This is because the address is assigned by hardware, while the kernel controls the device numbers. USB mode captures contains the device number. So don't be surprised when debugging firmware that address the firmware reports doesn't match the values shown in LSUSB or in Wireshark capture. When Thunderbolt 3 docking station is connected, chances are the Thunderbolt is used to tunnel PCI, PCI Express data to extensible host controller embedded in the docking station. In such case, there will be two additional USB root hubs visible in LSUSB output one for USB 2 devices connected to the docking station and one for USB 3 devices. When Thunderbolt 4 docking station is connected to a Thunderbolt 4 toggle host, then it is like unlikely for the new road hub to appear. Devices connected to Thunderbolt 4 docks are visible in the system of the USB 2 and USB 3 host controller belonging to USB 4 controller. Capture engines can be integrated into Wireshark using the XCAP interface. I have USB pickup CMD and all the XCAP copied into Wireshark XCAP directory. This makes it possible to see USB pickup and open visual interfaces in Wireshark interfaces list. This screenshot was made on the same computer the one on the previous slide. You can see that on Windows there are only two USB pickup instances, while on Linux there were five USB MON instances. This is because USB pickup does not have the equivalent to the special USB MON 0 interface, and Windows does not logically split extensible host controller into two separate root hubs. Just like on Linux, connecting Thunderbolt 3 docks resolves 
results in new USB pickup interface, while devices connected to USB 4 dock will end up on the existing USB pickup interfaces. When we click on the first icon next to the USB pickup interface, we can configure capture options. The options include snapshot length, which is how many bytes of single records to save. Unless we know what application or device driver submits large requests, we should probably keep the default snapshot length value. We can also configure the capture buffer length. We can increase it in case we notice missing data. But keep in mind that this buffer is allocated in kernel space within the non-page pool memory. By allocating capture buffer in non-page pool, it is guaranteed that the buffer will always reside in physical RAM. Non-page pool is never swapped to disk, so you should keep the capture buffer size reasonable. Next, we might want to select what we want to capture. I usually don't capture from all devices, but instead I capture from newly connected devices. I start the capture and only then plug in the device. By the way, the capture contains all the necessary descriptors that Wireshark dissectors can use. The option to inject already connected devices cap descriptors into capture data is useful when we are capturing data from device that is embedded into the system and we have no easy way to disconnect it. USB pickup will then fake the device and configuration descriptors request into the pickup data. If we don't capture from all devices, we can select individual device we want to capture from. The number in square brackets is the device address. Capturing USB in software on Mac is somewhat complicated. The capture is performed on fake network adapters but are visible in the system when booted with disabled system integrity protection. On Intel MacBook Pro from 2019, there are four such interfaces, VAC128, which corresponds to Apple T2 Pass, but connects the touchpad, internal keyboard, trackpad, headset, ambient light system, FaceTime camera, and T2 controller. XAC0, which captures super speed traffic for devices connected to the USB-C ports on the MacBook Pro left side. XAC1, which captures super speed traffic for devices connected to the USB-C ports on MacBook Pro right side. XAC20, which captures low, full, and high speed for devices connected to any USB-C port on either side. To capture, the interface has to be propped up using ifconfig. Just like on Linux, LSUSB can be used to determine to which bus the device is connected. Zephyr mass storage sample is on bus 20 because it is full speed device. macOS interface list is quite long and there are also four Thunderbolt interfaces visible. Regard the Thunderbolt interfaces are visible regardless of the system integrity protection state. However, the Thunderbolt interface can only be used to capture Ethernet traffic on local network interface that is brought up when two Thunderbolt 3 or Thunderbolt 4 capable devices are connected. Thunderbolt 4 in the Thunderbolt interfaces won't show any actual Thunderbolt layer packets. There is just the Ethernet traffic and no USB, PCI Express or DisplayPort data. On the screenshot traffic is observed on Thunderbolt 4 interface because the rear USB-C port on the right side was connected to USB-C port on Thunderbolt 4 compatible laptop running Linux. The other option is to capture in hardware. Capturing in hardware is useful when you are debugging host controller driver issues or if host, both host and device are microcontroller based and we simply cannot capture in software. OBX Cup presents separate interface for each USB 2 speed. Therefore, there is separate interface for low, full and high speed capture. Packet filtering can be enabled via OBX Cup option. It is quite useful to filter NACT transaction unless you are debugging some weird bug in the VIS driver or the device firmware. Filtering NACT transactions will significantly reduce the number of capture packets, making the capture file much smaller. When capturing full or high speed traffic, we can also filter start of frame packets. Every second, there are 1000 start of frame packets on full speed link and 8000 start of frame packets on high speed. So, how does OpenVisual work? 
On the left side, there's a USB Type-B connector that connects to half your host. The monitor device is connected to USB Type-A connector on the right. The USB Type-B connector on the right connects to target host. The link between the target host and monitor device is decoded by USB transceiver operating in passive mode. USB transceiver translates the differential signaling to ULPI. FPGI receives the ULPI data and extracts packets from there. The data is buffered in SD RAM. FTDI USB to serial converter connects capture host with the FPGA. FTDI FT two two three two H has two channels. On Open Visual, one channel is used to load the B stream into the FPGA, and the other channel is used to transfer the capture data. The only non-volatile memory on Open Visual is the EEPROM chip that stores FTDI configuration. The FPGA bitstream is always loaded from the capture host. Wireshark shows what the capture engine provided. For example, lib pickup USB mod provides USB packets with Linux header and padding. USB pickup provides USB packets with USB pickup header. Open Visual pro provides the actual USB packets. The USB packets are described in USB 2 specification chapter 8. Software sniffers can capture URPs captured to host controllers. Uh, submitted to host controller, USB URP stands for USB request block. The Linux header and USB pickup header contain OS specific URP information. If you develop software sniffer for another system and want to use Wireshark for this section, specify the OS dependent pseudo header and request link layer header type for it on TCP CAM mailing list. So, what software sniffers really show? Device driver submits uh, URP. ACD handles URB and reports back to device driver. All software sniffer packets contain OS specific metadata, URB ID, and what? And overs. Software sniffers spy on their interactions between device drivers and uh, ACD. Both when sending and receiving data, USB mod, USB pickup, and Mac XAC interfaces capture two packets. This one is from host to device and contains information that the device driver submitted. The second is after host controller driver has finished processing the data. For control transfers, the first packet always contains the set setup data. If the data travels from host to device, then the packet will contain both the set setup data and PI. If the data transferred from device to host, then the second packet will contain the data rest. For interrupt, book, and isochronous transfer, the payload is only in the one of the packets. For writes, the payload is in the first packet, while for reads, it is in the second packet. If the read fails or is cancelled, then the second packet will contain only OS specific metadata. For reads, the first packet indicates that the device drivers requested host controller driver to start read attempts. This is useful when debugging host software because if there isn't any data coming from the device, it might be that the host is not asking for it. If the host doesn't ask for data, the device cannot send anything. Now let's finally start Wireshark. I will capture Zephyr USB mass storage sample simultaneously with USB pickup and open visual. Let me just open uh, open all the uh, Wireshark, uh, Wireshark instances and let's go. So on the left, I, I, I will be capturing with USB pickup. We can open the options. I have the capture from newly connected devices selected. And on this generic USB hub, I have USB mass storage device Zephyr flash disk connected. However, I will be capturing only from newly connected devices. So now I will disconnect the device. So I disconnected it and it no longer appears in the generic USB hub. So let's start USB pickup capture. And here uh, on the right side, let's start open visual full speed capture with filtering NAC transaction and startup frame packets. However, I will be also dumping all the unfiltered data so we can compare the unfiltered and filtered. Let's start. Okay, now we can connect the device. Okay, I can disconnect the device now because I have uh, a lot of traffic to analyze and I can, I can stop it now. So let's start the analysis with comparing the filtered with unfiltered data. So when we scroll up to this uh, 
and filter data on the right, unfilter on the left, we can see that there are a lot of start of frame packets. There are so many of them, uh, but yeah, if, if we keep scrolling, we can see start of frame every now and then. Mm, for example, here and here, but there are a lot of them, a lot, really a lot. So uh, in Wireshark, we can filter them out with apply as filter, not selected. Uh, oh, I clicked wrong. Uh, we want the PID apply as filter, not selected. Okay. And now we can also change the filter to be more human readable because if it's A5, it's maybe not the, the clearest. So we can just type a SOF. So we, we can filter out all the SOFs and this uh, re removes over 2000 of packets. The, the re, uh, how, however, the difference uh, between the filtered and unfiltered is still well over 6,000 packets. Uh, so where this, uh, yeah, why there are so many NACs? Uh, basically the way it works, the host uh, controller, the ACI host controller is so fast, but it keeps Re asking device for data as fast as it can. So uh, the device obviously cannot cope, uh, especially this uh, Zephyr device on Nordic uh, low power uh, NRF52 um, uh, device. So so it the, the, the peripheral does knock the packets multiple times before, before the software finally arms the endpoint and then response uh, with the with the actual data similarly the other direction when the host is sending data to uh, to device the device can knock the data and then the host simply retries uh, and uh, finally when device is ready it acknowledges the data so uh, this is the big difference uh, between between the unfiltered and filtered uh, USB USB mon uh, USB link layer captures. So uh, we, yeah, we can see that this NAC is always, always is like the most common, this is perfectly fine on USB, but, but there's a lot of NACs. Uh, so let's compare now the USB pickup tool uh, to filter data. So first, uh, USB pickup starts asking the, the device driver uh, to address 12, but uh, link layer capture contains uh, the get descriptor request from device zero. This is because USB pickup does not capture the data at all, but uh, the host is uh, using this to, to know what is connected to USB device and to know the device uh, max packet size zero. This is needed to correctly reassemble the, uh, the link layer data packets into transfers. Because if this max packet, the max packet size for full speed device can be also value 8, 16, 32 or 64. If it was 8, then this data packet will be only the first eight bytes from here and the, the following data will be in the data zero packets but the host will have to read afterwards. Uh, uh, without knowing the uh, max packet size zero, it's really impossible for host to tell if the device intends to stop the transfer or if there's one more uh, data packet coming. Uh, so uh, then uh, the, well, the host knows what the device is connected, it issues the set address and it sets address 12. So we can see, but further down the line, the device accepted the address uh, and then we see transfers to, uh, to request the get device descriptor. Get device descriptor length 18. So this is most likely the same request. And then when we see the response, 
uh, it is yeah the, the, the response is the same only with metadata here it's nowhere to be seen in uh, in link layer capture and this PID and CRC is nowhere to be seen in, in USB pickup this lower layer is basically what's different but this higher layer this actual payload is essentially the same between the two uh, uh, here we see that there are a lot of uh, in, in in this open visual capture there are a lot of intermediate packets between the the data that clearly corresponds to this usb pickup we can simply filter uh, filter it with usb usb uh, usb filter so now it looks more or less the same let's now move to the configuration request we ask for nine bytes uh, of configuration descriptor but here the host was asking 255 so this is some different uh diff different request it, it asks for string descriptor and for device qualifier so this is a separate part of the uh, usb host stack that is not captured uh, with usb pickup only here when you ask for the configuration descriptor this is exactly the same request but we capture with usb pickup and we get the same the same response we get only nine bytes of the configuration descriptor because we only ask for nine bytes the total length is 32 while usb allows us uh, to basically request any length that can fit, fit on 16 uh, bits here many devices fail when the request is too large therefore the hosters ask for nine bytes and only then uh, ask for the remaining here we can see let's look uh, the configuration description because we have all the interfaces uh, this example is just the mass storage so we, we can see that it's the mass storage uh, with SCSI transparent command set so we will be seeing SCSI commands and it's using the bulk only transport the bulk only transport uses two endpoints uh, one is in to get the data from device to host uh, and also the status and the other one is out to get the data from host to device and commands from host to device both are number one but we can see that one is uh, in hexadecimal 81 the other is 01 the, these are really separate endpoints uh, one will be always uh, uh, accessed with the in token the other one will be always accessed with the out token on this uh, on the actual usb pass then we can see uh, the string descriptor request and we are asking for two bytes and both show really this malfor packet but this is really a problem in wireshark because this string descriptor is four bytes uh, but we only asked for two so we got two but wireshark tries to dissect it further but only when we ask for the four bytes we get the full response and wireshark is happily showing but this device supports the english united states language uh, for all string descriptors then we ask for the string descriptor uh, index free and in the configuration description uh, uh, now in device descriptor we can see that uh, a serial number is under the index free so we are asking for the serial number and the serial number is here so we can see that uh, we get the serial numbers in in both capture then the uh, uh, mass storage class uh, uh, driver is asking for uh, maximum loans on the on the device so we get just value zero this means that we have only one loan uh, which is the default case for for the uh, zephyr uh, mass storage uh, sample and then we proceed to scasi inquiry we, we can see that uh, this is the from host to uh, to the endpoint one the inquiry uh, it's scasi inquiry the mass storage part is just the simple wrapper <laughs> and the actual scasi is is here uh, here we can see <clears throat> that there is this urb bulk out that is not anywhere in uh, link layer capture 
This is because Lingla has has this old arc in uh, packets, but uh, in URBs we are only capturing the, the instance, but the request has finished successfully. Here it means uh, we get this, uh, this status success only after the device acknowledges the auto data. If, if the device nag the data, then the host will keep retrying, keep retrying until either timeout occurs, uh, in which case we would see a timeout here, or if, uh, until the device finally acknowledges, in which case we, we see the success. So uh, let's move to some uh, uh, USB with, with some more data, uh, like this uh, read. Mm, let's do some bigger read, this 16 bytes, we can, we can uh, easily find, the, uh, find it in the other uh, window by looking for the actual comma uh, by the transfer line. Let's apply as filter selected and let's copy this here. So we can find uh, it's this, we have this second, uh, second request, these are the same. So let's see uh, how uh, what what is the difference between the two. Here we have read, book out, book in. It means that the host will start sending the in tokens, reading reading the data, and then we have this eight uh, eight kilobytes of payload. And here we have sixty four uh, bytes of payload. And we keep get getting 64 bytes of payload until it is finally reassembled. And it's Wireshark shows where, where it reassembles and we can see, but this data here, um, uh, but this data here is exactly, exactly the same as here. As the data here, because it's the data that was read from the uh, from the disk. Mm, this. Yeah. And then we have the mass storage status. Here it's bundled together with uh, with its reassembled uh, URB, but on uh, Windows it is uh, yeah in the separate uh, URB request. This is because the host really went. So submitting this uh, in, in request, it knew what the total transfer length would be, but here Wireshark doesn't really pass this information uh, to, to the D sector, so the D sectors keep, uh, keep reassembling uh, the data until there's a short packet or zero length packet. In this case, it is the short packet, but it's in, uh, but it's here, and this is the the response status from from this mass storage. Okay, so we, we, I pretty much covered what I wanted, so let's move uh, back to the, uh, to the presentation uh, so we, we can get, uh, so we can get some uh, summary. Uh, okay, to the right. Uh, to sum it up, USB 2.0 is still relevant today and most likely will be there forever. Not only because there are multiple applications where USB 2 speeds are sufficient, but also because USB backwards compatibility with USB 2 is achieved by dual bus. Host initiated all communication in and out is always from host perspective. Device cannot send data unless hosts ask for it, that is when driver submits in URBs. Software sniffers capture URBs. Every URB is captured as two URB packets. Driver to ACI includes data payload from host to device. If any, an ACI to driver includes data payload from device to host, if any. URB level capture is sufficient for general use. However, understanding USB at packet level helps make sense out of the URB packets. So that's all for now. I'm waiting for your questions, so I will answer them. You will receive the presentation slides and also the captures that I uh, that I took during this uh, 
uh, this presenta uh, presentation, so you can check it out in depth later on. That's all for now. Take care. Bye.